that most leadership training is worthless. I wasn't that perfect. Passions can get you in a ditch real fast, okay? You don't really inspire anybody that way. You make mistakes, it happens, and that's okay. It's okay not to be perfect. Hello, and welcome to the LifeWorks podcast. Joining me today is someone that I have the privilege of calling a colleague, mentor, and friend. Colonel Tom Connolly is a retired United States Marine Corps officer. He's the founder and president of Connolly Consulting and the author of the breakthrough leadership book, Becoming a Leader, a roadmap for my daughter and the aspiring leader. Colonel, it is amazing to have you on the podcast today. Thank you for being with me. Hey, Mark, it's always great to have a conversation with you. I, thanks for having me. This is, this is really cool. I appreciate it. So I want to jump right in. You have an, a fascinating backstory. Tell us about your background for our audience members who haven't met you yet. My mom and dad were both World War II veterans and children of the Depression, right? So we were raised understanding hard work right? We were under, we were raised with, a, and my mom was a patriot, you know, and uh, my dad's most famous saying was, whatever you do, give it 110%. So I learned hard work. We all did at a young age, but my dad also told us, you know, if you want to go to college, it's on you. You're going to have to do it. And he also told us, you know, if you, I would hope you'd find time to serve your country at some point in your life. And he said, but if you go in the military, you should go in as an officer. Now, my dad spent 30 years in the Navy, was a master chief. We used to call him the master chief of the world, okay. higher than the master chief of the Navy. He was the master chief of the world. Of course, great leader, and we loved him dearly, but he was the icon of the family. And I was fifth of six. Uh, my three older brothers, an older sister, and I have a younger sister. You know, they were significantly older than me. They were off and doing their thing, been through college the whole nine yards. Well, a couple of them went to the Naval Academy. One had an NROTC scholarship. My sister worked her way up through the university system to be uh, very successful in uh, hospital administration. But I saw what they were doing, and I knew I'd been following my brothers around the baseball field for, for years, and they'd been coaching me there and mentoring me there. And I, I saw what they were doing, and they were military officers. They were two in the Marine Corps, one in the Navy. They... I, I want to do that. So I went to the Naval Academy. I got to the Naval Academy and I was pretty good at, at a lot of stuff. But I figured out that pretty quick that it isn't all about just working hard. Sometimes you got to work smart. You got to learn to study, act, reflect, and refine. You know, it's a continual process, right? And if you do it fast enough, they consider you successful. Then you can fix whatever you messed up before it's too messed up. I figured out later that that was, in fact, the cycle of a leader, especially in the military. So uh, I graduated from the Naval Academy. I got commissioned. We'll skip the pain and suffering of four years at USNA. It's always better if you major in something you really have an aptitude for. So I was an engineer and my aptitude was not as an engineer. So I have a technical background. I went in the Marine Corps and became an artillery officer. I like the idea of having a lot of stuff. I call it heavy junk. You know, you got trucks, you got guns, you got a lot of stuff that you have to manage, but you also have people that you have to lead. And there's a fundamental difference, right? You manage stuff, you lead people. So anyway, so I, I had the opportunity to command uh, at every level, if from platoons to battalions and super battalions, uh, headquarters battalion of a division, which is a lot bigger than your normal battalion, to do it overseas and in combat, to do some other duties like strategic analysis and recruiting and manpower and war gaming and future force development. So I, I got to do a, a whole bunch of things in the, in the Marine Corps. But after 30 years, it was over. You don't get to stay forever. You know, at 30 years, of commission service. If you're not getting a waiver for being a general officer, then, then you have to retire. And so when I retired, I got out and I went to work for a defense company thinking that I would just continue to do what I was doing in the Marine Corps, just do it in a defense company. But that's not the way it works. There's always somebody in the Marine Corps who's following you and taking your place. And they're in uniform and now you're wearing a suit. It's not the same. What I found out working for those two different companies, good companies, a big one and a small one, was that every time I was in a room somewhere, I seemed to always be 
talking to people about organizational dynamics of either the organization we were putting together for some contract or the organization that they had, that I was always talking about leadership, that we were doing all these things. And then one day I had a bunch of retired Marines in my house. We were actually celebrating the Marine Corps birthday. And I was introducing everybody to everybody because everybody didn't know each other. I mean, that's the, one of the neat things about the Marine Corps. You know, you, you go from here to there and around the world and you meet people who know you for different things, right? I mean, this these, some of these people know me from recruiting. Some people know me from the strategic vision analysis. Some people know me from the fleet. Some people know me only as an artilleryman. So you, you have all these people. And so I was going around the room and this guy's the IT guy and this guy's the weapons guy and this guy's. And so I'm introducing them all to each other. I got to the end and I said, and I'm, and one of the guys goes, you're the leadership guy. I was like, hmm, that's interesting. Because you spend your whole life and you write stuff about it. And you think about it. You, and I put a lot of thought into it. My daughter was getting ready to graduate from the Naval Academy. I had started writing the book. It was going to be an epic essay. And then I was like, yeah, it's going to be longer than an essay. You know, I was like, hey, this is going to be like 4,000 pages and multiple volumes. And I was <laughs> like, okay, I can't do that either, right? I got to zoom it in. And then I had a friend of mine read my first draft and he told me I needed to reorganize the whole thing. And by God, Ali, you were right, Mark. And so I did. But that didn't happen until after my daughter was already commissioned. And she came to me and she said, Dad, you got to write down all this stuff that you say. Okay. And that's the point where I said, you know what? Called my boss and I said, I want to do this. I want to teach leadership. I want to help people to improve their performance personally, professionally, spiritually, and physically. I want to do that every day. That's what I want to do. I don't want to do this other stuff. That's what you guys want me to do. I want to do this. And he was like, well, that's really good. And I laid it all out for him. And he's like, well, when do you want to do this? I said, I want to be able to do this in a year. And then there ended up being some other obstacles. He goes, well, you need to get started. And I said, and that's why I'm quitting. So here I am. And you know, when you write the book, writing anything down is a commitment, right? You put it down, it's kind of like, becomes formal. It's who you are. I didn't expect the book to become centerpiece in my work, but I also kind of thought I was a consultant and I really found out that I'm not. I'm a coach because I don't want to do somebody's work for them. I want to help them figure out what it is they need to do. It took me a little longer to write the book than I, than I figured, but I spent a lot of time learning a lot of things about stuff I already knew, if that makes any sense. And then you realize also that I wasn't that perfect. And that's okay. It's okay not to be perfect. You're always perfecting, right? Always getting right. better. And that's right. the idea is to improve continuously. So I want to get into the book and I want to just ask some really basic questions, but I don't know. I don't think that they're basic. So let's start out with some basic definitions about what is a leader and how is that different from being a manager? A leader has followers. Pretty basic. How's it different than being a manager? I think you manage things, you lead people. People have feelings and needs and people grow. Stuff is stuff. You, you put it places, you, you use it, you leverage it. But to me, the fundamental difference is that people have wants and needs and they need to be led. They want to be led and they will grow to be leaders if you lead them right. Leadership is the actions taken by a leader that causes his people to transcend to something greater than themselves. That's leadership. That's my definition of leadership. You know, as a leader, you may have to manage assets, but you need to lead people. And so you need to become competent uh, as a leader, as you can't just go around inspiring people. You also have to be competent in your industry, whatever it is. If you're a Marine, then you need to be competent in tactics and, and techniques and procedures of employing assets of warfare. At the appropriate level, it's tactics, operational arts strategy as you get more senior and, and you move up. But fundamentally, you have these two things. You have your competence as a leader and you have your competence in your industry, whatever your company does. But you have to develop both of those as you grow as a leader. And then and then you're leading the whole time you're doing this, right? You have to be in the moment too, right? You can't say, hey, hold on guys, let me get to there first. You don't get that choice, right? That's part of doing what must be done, right? Leaders have to do what must be done. Right? As you're developing this competence, you're constantly in that, remember that circle I told you about, right? Study, action, reflection, and refinement. You're constantly doing that right every day and that's why one of the things that i talk about is learn something every day teach something every day that's that cycle that keeps you going hopefully your that reflection is always that learning 
piece. Did I accomplish yesterday? Did I do the things yesterday that needed to be done? Do I need to do them today? Do I have to redo them today? What are those things? And and then, of course, when you think about that, you got to go, I got to be able to look in the mirror and know who I am and live what I believe. And I've got to be humble enough to know when I'm not. And maybe I got to look, stand in front of my people and, and, you know, I was wrong, but now I know different. And so let's go that way. Can you give us an overview of the main concepts in the book? So the first thing is you got to accept that everybody in your organization has value. Everybody. The disadvantage that you have in the military is you can't do anything about the people you have. You get them. So figure out who they are and employ them and make them their best selves, right? Now you do the same thing in the civilian world, only you get a choice as to who you hire. At that point, you have to commit when you hire that person, this is a, somebody I'm going to develop. I'm going to grow these people. I'm going, to, I'm going to make these people better. I'm going to help them move down the road. If you believe that, then you're in a constantly evolving conversation of how to improve yourself, the organization, and your people. So anyway, that is the prime imperative. Then the other five things are teach and learn something every day. Because if you're doing that, you're continually moving forward. And you're developing trust because you go find out what the answer is to whatever it is you're doing right? You start at your desk, becoming competent. Next point, becoming competent. You start at your desk, you expand that. You go, I need to learn something about what's beyond my desk. You go find the expert, you talk to them. They teach you because make somebody happy, sit down with them, let them tell you all about what they do. Mm -hmm. Holy cow, you made a friend for life. And then those people are your mentors in that area and they respect you because you cared enough to talk to them. At any rate, so you learn that, you bring it back to other people and you say, guess what I learned today? I learned this. And some of those people know that and some of those people don't know that. And so you just made everybody smarter and you made yourself smarter and you just developed trust and a certain level of humility in the process. So you, you, you teach something and you learn something every day. You develop your competence both as a leader and in your industry and what your technical specialty is, but you also have to own the mission. You have to know what it is you get paid to do. You have to learn that and you have to be good at it, but it needs to be yours. You're you're responsible for it. You are the leader. You're responsible for whatever your organization, you know, does or fails to do. And you have to take that on and you need to become one with it and you need to learn how your organization fits in the bigger organization and how your your company fits inside the industry and what does the industry do for the world? Because in learning all those things, you bring them back to your people. The number one thing that you can do as a leader is give your people context. Give them context. Why do we do what we do? You know, Simon Sinek talks about the why. A lot of that, the why he got working with Marines at Quantico. I didn't know that story. I heard that. That's a backstory. We have something we talk about when we issue orders. We talk about end state and intent. What's it going to look like when we're done? And how do we think we're going to get there? How does the leader see us getting there? And those things are important because sometimes it doesn't matter whether you take a straight line or, you know, circuitous route or whatever it is. And sometimes it does. But if every Everybody understands the end state and the intent, the context, and you give them a certain amount of license to innovate and adapt and create opportunity, people will. And they'll feel rewarded and valued in the doing so. In in all of that, you have to learn to do those things in the mission and in the organization. You have to own the mission. Then you need to go the extra mile. You need to reinvest in your people fundamentally. You need to be willing to open the kimono a little bit and be real with people. If people don't think that you are willing to help them, then you're never going to get past the veneer of what they bring to the office. Whether you like it or not, if you commit to being a leader, because really it is it's a commitment, you got to say, I, I want to do this. You may have not started out wanting to do it. You may say, I, I just really wanted to paint houses, but now I have a crew of six. Now I have to lead this crew of six. But if you're going to be a leader and you commit to being a leader, then you have to commit to the idea that you have to lead people and you have to get to know people. You have to develop relationships with people. You got to develop trust with them. And sometimes, and I learned this at a young age, as a lieutenant, I had a 19-year-old Lance Corporal who had a wife and they had a, they had already had one child. And I had another child on the way and Lance Corporals didn't get paid much. They don't get paid much now. They got paid even less then. And they really didn't know how to budget and spend and they were in a bad situation. His wife did not want to sit down and talk 
to the chaplain or financial planners or anybody else. I finally convinced them to sit down. And all of a sudden, I became Chaplain Connolly. And I taught them how to do a budget. And I worked them through the budget. And I showed them how they needed to spend it. And they went through the growing pains. I mean, a very young couple, right? 19 years old. And every time there was an issue, she only wanted to talk to me. She would not go talk to the chaplain. She would not go talk to anybody else. She would only talk to me. So I'm doing marriage counseling at a very young age, right? You can spend a whole day doing this on multiple different occasions. And you didn't really sign up to do that, right? I signed up to blow things up and go kill the enemy, right? But the fact of the matter was that's what needed to be done. This young man was a good Marine, but he and his wife needed somebody to help. What I didn't realize was that in helping them, it sent a signal to the entire organization that I was willing to help. That, does that mean that everybody lined up for me to do their taxes and everything else? No, I did, it did not happen. But they knew that I was willing to do what they needed if they needed it. And so you learn that lesson early. You've got to be real. You've got to be honest and you've got to be willing to help. And that means outside the office sometimes. That's just the way it is. And you don't have to legislate all this. I mean, it always drives me nuts. You know, you, you have a law that says they get this much time, people get this much time off and you got a law that says you got to have daycare on site or whatever it is, right? If you're a leader, you don't, you don't need all those laws because as a leader, you go, what do I have to do to make sure that my people are taken care of? I shake my head and I say, laws don't solve those problems leaders solve those problems. Leaders build culture. They build culture by solving problems, by creating an environment where people want to come to work, where they want to be there. Not because you gave them more money to pay for daycare, but because you helped them solve the problem. Maybe it was more money. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe it was something else you did. Maybe it's flexible hours. Maybe you gave them a better computer so they could actually do the work from home. Whatever it was, right? It, it's just amazing to me. But we'll write laws ad infinitum. I mean, we got laws that nobody even knows exist because what? I'm not sure. But that's not what leaders don't need laws. Leaders need to care about their people. So if you do those things, I mean, that's kind of a roadmap to how do you get there? There's a lot of stuff inside that. You unpack it. I think I could write another book about any one of those topics, but I'm not sure that that's necessary because I think that leadership is nuanced enough that, and this is part of the reason that I, I tried to keep it short like this, no matter where you go, no matter what you do and at every level, you're the apprentice. And I talk about the apprentice vocation. Leadership is an apprentice vocation. Best learned from a master, but always in your life, having a master, a peer, and a, an apprentice so that you're learning while you're teaching, while you have that peer, that colleague that can look at you and go, yeah, that's not a good idea. He <laughs> can be the one that talks to you unabashedly about what you, what you may be contemplating or doing or whatever it is. You know, so you're in this apprenticeship and at every level of the organization or whatever new organization, you change companies. You go to the exact same job. Is it really the exact same job? No, it's not. It's like the exact same job. It's very similar, but there's different people there, which makes a different culture. It's a different place, maybe, which makes different environment. It's different client, maybe, or different mission. And that makes for a different, a different line of work. All of those things impact that triangle that I talk about, the mission, the organizational dynamics and the leader. And the leader has to be what keeps that triangle operating or upright. And it's not scientific. It's not mathematical. That's why I say I can sit here and talk to you about leadership all day. We can write 150 books. But the fact of the matter is that when you go to that next job, it's not going to be exactly the same. And that's why it's a roadmap. And there are certain fundamental principles. And you have to expand on those at every level. So in your book, you get into self-management or self-leadership quite a bit. What are some of the most important things that we need to remember in leading ourselves first? The reason I put the book together the way I did is because when you're a young leader, the first thing that you got to learn is who you are and who you want to be. You got to have some level of personal organization and understanding of that before you can move out. But like I said, you, you have to lead from where you're sitting right now. You don't walk in and your boss goes, okay, here's the job. And you go, okay, hold on a second. Give me like, you know, two months to get my stuff together. <laughs> ah, it doesn't work like that. So, I, but I would tell everybody that you, you, you need to understand who you are and who you want to become. I talk about this a little bit in the book. You know, I was on recruiting duty. I'd been on recruiting duty for about 18 months, working on the enlisted 
recruiting management side. And so I'd learned all the things that recruiters do. And I had to go through training for sales and all that stuff. And so I was the operations officer for the station. I did that for about 18 months. All of a sudden, one day, out of nowhere, I get orders to go and become the assistant officer selection officer. And they were looking for officer candidates to become platoon leaders class or OCC, officer candidate class. Okay, so graduates and undergraduates. Little different process, different market. And now I was a hands-on recruiter. And the first six months, I had a big zero. I had done three applications and they had not been approved. I had produced zero contracts. But I, when I was looking at what the OSS had done, they hadn't made mission in seven years. And when I went to their college files, they didn't even know that they had just Marine officers. You guys don't even, did you guys know this? No, no, we didn't know that. Let's call him. You know, so you call the prof and you go, hey, professor, I'm Captain Connolly. I'm, I'm the new OSO in town. And I would like to, you know, have a cup of coffee with you, you know, when I'm up on campus. So I was doing a lot of stuff and I, I was trying to do these things. But once again, the Naval Academy thing, got to be smart, work smarter, not harder. And I I had learned some of these tools, but it was all over the place. But anyway, so I was able to produce some contracts enough to not get fired. And all of those guys made it through OCS, which means I had high enough quality. But that summer rolled around and they fired my boss. And I uh, was sitting on the floor of my apartment with this thing of tapes that I had ordered from my planner company. It was a, a program, it's called Time Power by a guy named Charles Hobbs. So I'm sitting on the floor on a Saturday morning listening to these tapes. And I listened through them the first time and I went, oh man, I need to listen to that again. And so the next day I sat down and I listened to them again and I had this stack of notebook paper. I still have all that stuff. I have every goal I've ever written since 1988. I sat down and I said, what this is really about, this is about aligning your performance with your highest values. So people talk about, you know, doing your passions. What are your passions, right? Follow your passion. Eh, passions can get you in a ditch real fast, Okay. I like ice cream, but if I spend all my time eating ice cream, I'm going to be a big fat man. And that has other repercussions, right? But the real answer is, you know, why not take all of your time and figure out those things you value most to take all of your time and put your time against those things that you value most. Put your passion into the things you value most. But I was just sitting there going, you know, I'm a Christian. What's my highest value? I'm a Christian. I wasn't going to church. I wasn't praying. I wasn't reading the Bible. Like, what am I doing to be a Christian? I'm not being a Christian very good. So the one thing that I could affect right then. What was the one thing I could affect right then? I could pray. So I started praying. And from that point on, every day of my life, I started praying. Eventually, I, you know, I, where, where you go in the church, etc. But who do I want to be? What do I want to become? What are my highest values in life? And you start off with a, maybe a whole bunch, but you neck them down, right? And you spend 15 minutes a day just going, hey, how, how do I do this? And that has implications for your goals. What are your skills and abilities? What are your motivations? What are your mindsets? What are your networks? Who are the people you need to know? What are the relationships you need to build? You look at something, you go, I have this goal. I want to do this. Okay. Do you have the skills and abilities to do that? What do you need to learn to do that? What's my motivation for that? Is it just because I want to be a millionaire? What is my motivation? What is the mindset that I need to do that? And then, okay, who do I need to know? What relationships do I need to have? Who are the experts that can help me get there? So you start looking at each of these things and these are these become smaller goals. I have to go find somebody who can help me become a real estate investor. I need to find somebody who can teach me about houses, about inspections. I need to have somebody teach me about loans. You know, if I'm going to be a real estate investor, you know, whatever it might be, who do, who do I want to be? What are my highest values? What do, what do those things mean to me? I think those things are very important as a leader to know who you are because you get to choose who you are. You just don't get to choose what kind of leader you're going to be. I mean, you get to choose whether you're going to be positive or negative. The rest of it, you don't get to choose. If you're going to be a leader, you have to be what the organization needs. You have to be what the people need. If you're a leader, you have to be focused outward, outward and upward. You're going to be thinking not about yourself, but about your people. So you got to know who you are. You got to spend some time figuring that out if you haven't. And I would tell you, even if you think you have, write it down. Because remember, writing the book, when you write it down, all of a sudden you go, wow, is that what, really what I think? Is that really what I want to be? Is that really what I want to tell myself every day? That that's the reason I'm doing this? When I was young, I, I wanted to be a millionaire. That would be it. Be a millionaire. Along the way, I discovered that being a millionaire didn't really, that's not the thing. Why, why do you want to be a millionaire? What do you, are you just going to sit on it? And what if you get there when you're like 75 and, you're, and you die at 
77. Do you die a happy man? And what if you did it by stabbing everybody in the back? When you die, do they just like throw you in the ditch because you didn't make anybody happy going down the road? And the answer to all those things is that's not the way, right? So you, you get to define what success is, what you want it to be. How much do I really need to live? Is that what my objective is? Is my objective to be able to do something more? So as you look at this, you, you have to start here. Who do I want to be? Why do I want to be that? What do I have to do to get there? And those are become intermediate goals. And then you got to look at, okay, what about work? Because it isn't all about this, right? And this job may not be anywhere near what I really want to be over there. But who says you can't figure out the path that gets you there over time? You don't have to make your money doing the work that you love. You can make your money doing something else and still do the work that you love. There are goals that I've attained years later that I wrote down someplace and I was like, I'm never going to get that. And one day it's there and you go, "Yeah, wow, didn't that line up pretty well? Because along the way, you had already done the things along the way to bring that into fruition. Yeah. You just, you gave up too soon. Most battles are lost by commanders who give up, not by commanders who've been beaten. You can also go and look at the Russo-Japanese War. And in fact, that's a war that was the whole war came to who ran out of ammunition and who gave up. As the leader, now translate that into how do I do this for my organization? Now, as a young leader, it's much simpler because you pretty much have control of what you do every day. As a more senior leader, your organization now crosses many, many boundaries and it now interacts with people that you don't control and things you don't control. And now that becomes more complex. But those are things that you learn to do along the way and you're constantly reaching out to do. The whole idea of the book is, and the whole idea of self-management is to understand who you are, understand what you believe in, and then be able to say, here's the, the skills, abilities, right? Networks and motivations that I need to get to there and then begin doing that one thing at a time. I heard somebody the other day say to-do lists are bad. To-do lists are bad if you just write down a to-do list and then start checking them off from the top because they're not prioritized. It's just a to-do list and, and the human mind will immediately go to the easiest task, right? And you'll knock out all the easy ones and then the, only the big painful ones, right? The ones that get you the most movement and the greatest reward are left and they don't happen easily. So do the hardest things first. Okay. And I, I've heard you say even recently that your, for you, your will is, is highest early in the morning. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah and by the oh, end yeah, of the yeah, day, yeah. You're complete. You're depleted. Well, there's a there's a there was a study that came out, and it, basically the study said that your reserves of will, right, they're full at them in the morning, but over the course of the day they get whittled away. So your ability to motivate yourself to do things that are hard, to do things you don't want to do, and so so if they're hard or if they're contentious, they require yeah. an ethical you know, balance. They require you to really consider what's right and what's wrong or, you know, what's the most important thing. Those are hard decisions. And when you weigh that on yourself at the end of the day, you run the risk of making a bad decision, right? And so right. my advice to that is always try and make the hard decisions, you know, ethically, morally, whatever it is, do those things early in the morning, when your reserves are high and you can hold the line on the standard and who you are, what you want to be. And you don't go, yeah, just pay them a thousand dollars and get on with it. You know, okay, well, sometimes that's the right answer, but not most of the time. Most of the time, you know, let's give it a little thought and let's do it at the, at the best time to make those decisions. But yes, you're right. hundred percent. What causes us to want to follow another person. But I, I think there were four things that there was actually a study, there's a 20 year study that was done of industry and they tracked what were these things that are caused people to, you know, to follow their leader. Are they honest? Do they have integrity? You know, can you trust them? Yeah. Okay. That's great. Vision. Do they know where they're going? Do, do they have an idea of what's coming over the horizon? Competency. Do they know their industry? Do they know their job? Are they competent as a leader? That's why I would put that in there. That's, you know, when I say competency, right? I say, two types of competency, your competency in your industry or your company and your competency as a leader, right? And then inspiration. Do they have the ability to inspire people? You already heard me say that's 
fundamental job one of leaders is to inspire people to achieve. Can they do that? Those are the four. Now they had a whole long list of these things and they tracked it for 20 years and it was different in different places and different industries. But those four percolated to the top of all of those things, right? When you look at a leader and and you go to work for someone, I can work for a, a competent good guy. That's easy, right? He knows his job. He's all that. He's competent, good guy. I can work for an incompetent good guy because he's a good guy. And I know my job, so I don't care really if he's incompetent. I can work for him. I can work for a, uh, for a competent asshole, for lack of a better term, okay? <laughs> I can work for – I can do that because he knows his stuff and I can excuse that he's not a great person as long as that doesn't become an ethical thing. But I can't work for an incompetent asshole. Because he not only doesn't know what he's doing, but he doesn't treat people well and he doesn't, you know, and he's not a good person. So you can't work for that guy. So who, who do you follow? What depends on your circumstances? Who would make you follow somebody? And then don't make the mistake of thinking that somebody that you vote for or somebody that holds a position is necessarily a leader. There's a difference. It's even some of our elected officials are not leaders. And it would kind of depend on how people define what a leader is. We've had even presidents of the United States who don't really give a crap about people. We have their quotes that say so. Yeah. And we have their actions that do as well in history. Or they don't care for whole classes of people or whole races of people. So, so people can be in positions of authority and not be leaders. Why would you follow somebody? Well, if they got those four things, if you can put an X in all those blocks, that's a good reason to follow them. But make sure that that's what, you, what you're really supposed to do. Or are you looking for an excuse not to do what you're supposed to do? Maybe you're supposed to be the leader. Our country was founded on rugged individualism, right? Our country was founded on the idea that every person has unalienable rights to go forth and pursue life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Nobody said that we were founded so that everybody could sit in a huddle and wait for somebody to come and give them porridge. We had thousands and thousands of people on, in soup lines during the Great Depression. There were people that, that got paid unemployment who paid it back when the Depression was over. They paid it back because that internal piece of them was so strong that they said it was alone and I have overcome my difficulties now. People have lost sight that that's the standard. Mm -hmm. The standard is you stand on your own two feet and you make your way. You bring others with you. And when you do that, you bring others with you because you now become inspiring, not just to the people that are in your organization, but everybody around you. You did it. You did it during this pandemic. You said, I'm going to do something that I wouldn't do for a while, but I'm going to do it now because this is the opportunity. And here I am talking to you, doing something that wasn't going to happen for another five years. And you're bringing other people along with you and you're learning things that you wouldn't have otherwise learned. And dang it, that ain't the American dream. As you look at government, industry, and the military, do bad leaders outnumber the good ones or are they about equal? No, I don't think bad leaders out, outnumber. I think what happens, mm -hmm. though, is it's real easy to focus on the people that are bad. It's real easy for them to kind of stand out, especially when our media cycle and everything else is yeah. oriented towards dirt and bad yeah. stuff. In 30 years in the Marine Corps, I worked for three guys that I didn't like, three out of, I don't know, hundreds of leaders that I worked with. But the unfortunate part is that somebody gets fired for something, they do something. 30 years ago, it might have not been a firing offense, but because it, it's, it's in the news, it's on a podcast, whatever it is, it now becomes more heinous. People right. still make mistakes. People still screw stuff up. Even when you're a general, even when you're president, for God's sake, you make mistakes. It happens. If you expect everyone to be perfect every minute of the day, boy, what world did you grow up in? And, and have you looked at yourself in the mirror lately? I make a mistake every day, at least one every day. And leaders make mistakes. And, and the real answer is, are you humble enough 
to say I made a mistake. You want to know why people don't want to run for public office? You want to know why people, you know, why you're not necessarily getting the best quality people everywhere? Because we we destroy them if they make a mistake. Do you, yep. do you want somebody that never tries boldly? I love Teddy Roosevelt, man in the arena, right? right. Do you want the guy who stands on the outside and just goes, la, 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 or do you want the guy that's in there willing to get dirty, mix it up and try and come up with a better outcome for his people, his country, whatever it is every day. Because if, you, if that's what you want, then you're going to accept some kind of mistakes. You have to. The idea of being human is not because we weren't made perfect. It's because we have free will to make imperfect decisions. There are plenty of great leaders out there. And there are plenty of great people out there. There are plenty of great people doing great things. I just think that we give way too much time and press to the ones who aren't great. What are some of the misconceptions that either leaders or people have about leadership? That you have to know everything. You don't have to know everything and you're never going to know everything. And once you get there, you, you've arrived. And that's, that's not true either. I think those are the, the two biggest. And, that, and then one we just talked about, that you're never going to make a mistake. Leaders are never going to make a mistake. Wrong. We want to throw stones at presidents and congressmen and people in business, etc. And most of the time we'll do that without ever finding out what the circumstances, facts, or figures were at all. Can anyone lead? Can anyone lead? No, anyone, anyone cannot lead, but I don't know anyone that can't lead if they commit to it. Because you go back to the, that whole circle, right? Leaders are not born, they're made, but they're not made until they actually commit to being a leader. You can't force someone to be a leader. You can put them in a position of authority that doesn't mean they're going to lead and it doesn't mean that they're going to take it seriously. But if they commit to being a leader, They'll do these things, right? They'll work on being competent. They'll work on teaching, learning something and teaching something. They'll commit themselves to that lifelong endeavor of study, action, reflection, and refinement so that they're continually getting better. And I have seen personalities of all sorts be great leaders. Can every leader be successful in every situation? And, and I would tell you, no, they mm -hmm. can't. Not initially, not until they've gone through it a couple of cycles of study, action, reflection, and refinement. But, but that's why you have guys that go from, we see CEOs, you know, and people get fired from one job after they've been a great success somewhere else. Right. Because right. they go someplace else and the circumstances are all different. And maybe they try and do the same thing and it all yeah. blows apart. And this is the, the kind of the neat thing about learning to lead in the military, because your people are always changing. Your circumstances are always changing. Even if you're in the same organization, your boss is always changing. All these things are changing all the time. So you're having to learn to adapt to every one of these factors as it changes. There's very little that's stable on any given day. You know, you take a, a whole organization to combat. They come back, they're combat trained, they're ready, they're good to go, and you lose a third of them right away boom. And now you got to start over. And that starts with the assessment process right on down to, okay, now how do I, how do I get these guys back up on the step to be ready for the next thing? In your book, you talk about culture change. How do you change culture in an organization? Leaders change culture and you change it one step at a time. But there's many, many steps that are being done by many, many people. A leader's number one job is is change. What do you have to do if you're not continually changing something? Because things change every day. That's what you do as a leader. You manage change. You lead change. Why are you inspiring people to get better? Because anytime you change the status quo, right, let's get philosophical for a minute, right? As soon as you cause someone to improve something, you just changed the circumstances, right? So as soon as you improve a process, you've changed something. And that's going to also have impacts on your culture. Right? Because now maybe somebody's got to come to work earlier, or you've got to hire more people, or whatever it is. These things have impacts. So as a leader, I mean, change is continuous. You need to continually be thinking about that. And you need to continually be thinking about how does that change impact my culture? But the culture is a result. I don't think you change culture. You, you can look at culture and say, I want it to look like this, but you need to be doing the right things for the mission and the organization in order to create the culture. 
You don't create a culture by going taco Tuesdays. We're going to have taco Tuesdays. That's not, you know, that's junior high school, right? Taco Tuesdays, I'm pres- become president. That's not how you change the culture. You don't really inspire anybody that way either, right? You have to think about, all right, what's our mission? And do our people understand our mission? And what's our organization and the organizational di- dynamics? Do we have the right number of people, the right kind of people, the right people in the organization to accomplish the mission? Okay, we do. If we have both of those things, now, who's the leader? What kind of leader do we need to have? Do we have decentralized decision making? Do we have matrix organization? Do we have a hierarchical organization? Do we have a strong leader? Do we need a strong leader? What what are those things? And those and then when you look at that and you say, okay, and what are our values? What do we value? Do we value in our employees? What do we value in our in, in our in our organization? Because those are the things the governance of all of that, right, that you think about corporately, not just the leader going, oh, and we will, easy to do if you're one man show, I can make all those dictates to myself, right? And then I don't even keep them. But you, when you look at your organization, and you say, what are those values? That's how you create the culture. And you say, it's one day at a time. And every time the leader opens his mouth, it has an impact on culture. When I was a young battery commander, I was captain and I had a 140 man unit. You wanted to go and stand in front of your formation every day. It just feels good to stand in front of your organization every day. There's a problem with that. And my first sergeant was like, sir, you don't want to do that. Okay, why don't I want to do that? Because when you do that, then all of your staff NCOs are now in the back of the formation because all the officers are out front. And so if you do that every day, then pretty soon... The staff NCOs don't feel valued and the troops aren't looking to them, their first line leadership, to give them answers. I get that. And so it wasn't necessary and it never is necessary for the boss to stand in front of everybody every day and say, this is the way it's going to be. It's really good for your ego. It isn't necessarily good for your organization because there are other leaders who should be given that opportunity and who need to be the person coordinating whatever it is that day. President Reagan, he was the standard for a long time. And he gave very few press conferences. He gave very few messages to the country, very little of that. And President Bush, Herbert Walker Bush, followed very much the same kind of play for four years. But when Clinton came in, all of a sudden, he's on nighttime shows and the whole world was like, what the heck? And now you go fast forward to President Trump and you have a, a completely different... And the question is, is it bad or is it good? And it depends. And when you get into politics, there's a whole bunch of other factors that go with it. But when you're just talking about organizational dynamics, you're talking about leading an organization, then it's important that, that you understand where you're at, what you're trying to convey, what you're trying to do. Because sometimes standing out in front of the organization is exactly what you need to do. Guys, I made that decision. This is what we need to do. This was a mistake yesterday or whatever it was. And let's go that way. When I was in Iraq, I couldn't put everybody out in formation at one point because it made you a big target. But what they needed from me was context. They needed to hear from me what was going on. So I went to a bazillion 20-man formations all the time, every opportunity I had to just reiterate, here's where we're at, here's what we're doing, here's what we think the enemy's doing, here's what we expect from you guys, here's where we need to continue going, what questions can I... It was, it was like a listening tour, kind of like going around to all the schools in the district and go, right. what, what's on your mind? But that's what they needed. That's what needed to happen for my men at that point in time in that mission. I'll go even farther because you've heard, you kind of heard this story I, and, and just to the culture piece. You got to kind of go, how do I get to that? What's the piece that's missing? What is the thing that you need to get across? Do I need to get in front of some message? What Those are all things that can get at culture and can hurt culture or strengthen it. As we were getting ready to go to, go to Iraq, my chaplain was disqualified, not allowed to go. And so I deployed to Iraq without a chaplain. Now, I believe, you know, then and still do, that in combat, having a spiritual guide and sounding board for your Marines is very important, but we didn't have one. So I was like, okay, so I can't be that guy, but I can, maybe I can insert something here. I began to go to every mission brief as the Marines were preparing to go someplace. And when they got done, I would give them 
30 seconds because I don't want to get in the way or confuse their orders or anything like that. But at the end, then I would say, okay, you got your orders, you know where you're going and you know what you're supposed to do. Platoon commander's giving you all those things. So just remember that uh, St. Barbara's got your back. Uh, St. Barbara is the patron saint of artillery. So they all know who St. Barbara is. I started saying, you know, St. Barbara's got your back because I just wanted them to know that there was, they, there was something greater than them, that they have, to have faith. I couldn't go, you know, I, I, you can't jump up and down as a, a, you know, somebody who works for the government, you know, as a, as a military man and, 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 and tell them to, you know, follow, you, you know, you follow my savior, Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, because you're not allowed to do that, but you gotta have, I'm trying to get them to make sure that they have faith. And it wasn't long before they all had their own pre-operational prayers that they would do. I didn't incite it. I didn't ask them to do it. They just started doing it. But there was always somebody, one of the Marines who would lead the platoon before they went out the gate, the pre-operational prayer. When we returned, I turned over command and I left. And I got a phone call from my sergeant major one day, my senior enlisted advisor, right? For those of who aren't military, he said, uh, sir, I want you to know that we've recast the battalion coin. I said, really? He said, yes. Normally the Marine Corps globe and anchor is on the front. Eagle globe and anchor, the Marine Corps emblem is on the front and you have the battalion crest on the back. But he said, no, battalion crest is on the front. The motto of the battalion is God fights on the side with the best artillery. God fights with 311. Okay, that's a not a quote, but a you know, almost quote of Napoleon. So I got the coin in the mail and I and I looked at it and there's the battalion crest on the front. I turned it over and St. Barbara was on the back. Only the guys that had been with that battalion during that time frame yeah. understood why St. Barbara was on the back. Yeah. But it's about the culture, right? And Maybe. it's about doing things and so sometimes you you know you're looking for a way to show up the culture and 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 I eventually did get a chaplain and and he did a great job and we were blessed to you know we had we had some casualties we had we only had one marine that was killed for the risk that they were taking that my marines were taking every day and and uh, etc that was just, everybody thought that I was extraordinary it wasn't really me you know, it was either divine intervention or the great innovations that the youngsters, uh, sergeants and lieutenants and, you know, on the road that they came up with. They did some amazing things, amazing things. But anyway, so culture, right? Leaders, everything you do and say builds culture. And that's about values and bringing all those things together. Your business is performance improvement. If you wanted to assess an organization of any kind, can you talk us through how you would assess that organization from a performance perspective and determine what improvements need to be made? Okay, so there's always a process, right? And I have a process. I think that when you look at an organization, it begins with an assessment of some sort. First caveat to any of this is, you know, what size is the organization? What do they do? What's their mission? When I begin a, a process with, a, with an organization, I would ask them to send me what their corporate values are. Send me what their mission statement is. You know, send me what their organizational structure is. Send me as much as they have about the operation of their company. I don't want their books. I don't want their numbers. I don't want how much money they really made last year. I don't really want any of that. What are you supposed to do? What do you do? And kind of how do you have things laid out? Because starting with that, you can see some things, right? And you ask that question, you'd be surprised how many people come back and go, what do you mean by values? What do you mean by mission statement? Well, we, we do this. Is that all you do? Is that it? I mean, you know, what's the purpose of that? And go, what's your process? And they, and they go, uh, what do you mean process? And well, how do things get from here to there? How do you get from the challenge to the output? The more of that that I get early on, I can look at and say, there are symptoms here. And then you can go, go talk to people and begin to find out where's the issue? What's the problem? Now, sometimes people will tell you right up front, I need you to work with this guy. I need you to look at mm. this thing because they think that it's that area. And, and that's okay. Yeah. No, that's okay. They can say that because you can go in real quick and, and probably go, yes, it is or it isn't. Or, or maybe that's part of it. The hardest part is it's also the easiest part. The easiest part is talking to people. You go into an organization and say, okay, so tell me what you do every day. 
start with you come to work at this time and you do <laughs> right. these things. And then you ask the next question, why do you do those things? Because now you're getting at, do they even understand their job? Do they even understand what their job is supposed to be? Did anybody break them in and tell them, do you have an onboarding process that, where they actually learn their job? So what I'm telling you is it depends on what you think your big problem is. Are you just trying to get better or do you have something you're trying to fix? Because if you're trying to get better, then okay, then let's start at the top and go, what's our mission? What's our values? Where do we want to go? What's our, what's our vision? Where are we trying to go to? What have we done to, to try and create that? And one is very cooperative and, you know, and get everybody as involved as you can to try and figure it out. And one approach is being more like a detective trying to figure out what's the underlying difficulty. But you know, you start with values and processes and, and capability. Do we have governance? Do we understand how we get from here to there? And then you got to start looking at, at people and say, do we have the right people in the right places? Well, are these people actually trained and talented to do what they're doing? Maybe you need to swap these folks, you know, because the, you got the, you got this guy who should be over here and this guy who should be over here or, or you know, or this gal that, you know, should be doing this or, or way up here. And then you, you look at things like morale and, you know, morale is very, can be very, in, you know, intangible, you know, are you happy here? People don't usually tell you the truth about whether or not they're happy. Happy gets to be kind of an all-encompassing thing. It yeah. has to do with life experience. How much money do they really need to have? You know, you should ask them the question. You know, if I paid you a million dollars, would you still do this job? Well, no. Okay. So why do you do this job? You do this job because money, convenience, whatever it is, and you feel rewarded doing it. And then you can look at, you know, packages, you know, um, I worked for a great little, little company and, the, and the, the boss was the president. He had a tremendous benefits package, best benefits package I ever saw. He was willing to help anybody improve themselves and, you know, willing to, you know, give them money to do so. You don't want to leave that kind of a company, right? And you want to you want to do good work for them. So you, you have to go walk that dog, right? And you have to go find those things. And then if you if you can find those things, then the next piece is okay. So how can we change that? How can we make that better? How can we resolve the thing? I'm never one to say you should fire somebody. It's not a recommendation that I, I would. I would make or I would make lightly. You know, I think that that's a very rare occasion. I think it's more about people might say it's a culture problem. Well, it's probably not a, a culture problem. It's a it's kind of like a prebiotic problem. What grows the culture? What things are you doing as a leader or not doing as a leader that's causing this to happen? And there's the real issue. The real issue, does the president or the CEO or the CFO or whoever is calling me in really want to hear those answers? Do they really, are they really interested in changing it or they just want to fix their bottom line? Because you're not going to fix your bottom line until you fix the top line. So yes, there's a process, you know, and, and like I said, it varies with the type of company and what you're doing, but inevitably it's going to rest at the door of the leader. It's really actually pretty easy to solve the problems of people down the chain. It's the people at the top of the chain. There was a study, I think a Harvard Business Review did a study and said that most leadership training is worthless because most leadership training, the leaders don't go. They do all the training for all the subordinates and the leaders never commit to it. And so the subordinates are just more frustrated and more irritated because they've been, they've learned all the right things, but they can't do it because nobody up the chain is doing it right. or believes in it. So if they don't believe in it, then you're not going to solve the problem. What do our leaders need from us as those that support them? An honest effort. And when I say honest effort, I think that means feedback and honesty. I, I, I was, it was interesting. I was sitting in a conference yesterday and I was always sitting there. I was thinking about the, the speaker on the stage had said something and it caused me to think about old Sergeant Major friend of mine who, when he was a gunny or a first sergeant, and I was counseling him on his annual performance appraisal. When I got all done talking to him about his performance appraisal, he says, okay, sir, are, are we done talking about me? And I said, yeah. He says, so here's my appraisal of you. And I was like, okay. And, but he was right on. Very few people could pull that off with me. But from that point yeah. on, I began to ask that question at the end when I counseled people, yeah. especially senior people, about what they did. 
But up until that point, very rarely or never did your subordinates tell you where you did well or failed. He was right on the money, you know, and I didn't like everything that he had to say. But he did a great job. If you give your leaders an honest day's work to include honest feedback, then leaders know that they can, they can make estimate and, and judge off what's going on with that. When people don't give an honest effort, then the leader has no idea where the organization is actually going because people aren't giving it their best. And, and if there's a problem, then I highlight the problem so that at least the leaders can go, we need to adjust and go that way or this way, or this person's got a better idea. Let's do that. Because no leader that's worth a salt. Well, let's just put it like this. They're not a leader if they're not willing to accept good constructive criticism. And that's the hardest thing for a developing leader to, to learn, but you got to learn it. It's not easy, but you got to, got to be willing to take it. Can anyone become a better leader at any age or experience level? Or do leaders plateau at some point in their ability and their ability to change? And I'm thinking specifically about those at the senior level. I believe that anybody can do anything if they want to do it. Yeah, I have a saying, right? Yeah, and you've heard this before. I think you've heard this one before, right? All things are possible with prayer and heavy deadlifts. Heavy deadlifts is, is a metaphor for the average person, but you know yeah. that I'm a power lifter, right? And I do. So I do. Heavy deadlifts has a very literal meaning for me, right? right? right. If, you're, if you're willing to have faith and do the work, you can do anything. You know, my dad died when he was 80, right? Mm -hmm. And he smoked his whole life, but he mowed his lawn until he was 75. Yeah, he, he took care of his house, mowed his lawn, all that stuff. When he was 75, he decided to quit smoking. I guess it's never too late. But at the same time, he moved into an assisted living facility with my stepmother. They moved into And he, so all of his tools and his shop in the backyard and everything got put away. And he didn't have a lawn to mow anymore. In five years, he was dead. So I told my wife, I said, don't sell the lawnmower ever. Okay? Because it's all about yeah. mowing the lawn. If you want to play baseball when you're 80, then keep playing baseball. If you want to be a leader when you're 100, then keep being a leader. I lift weights, I power lift, I run, I do all these things. I do them with faith that say Barbara's got my back, right? And God's allowing me to do those things. But I also do it to put a thumb in the eye of, of pessimism that yeah. I can't do this. When I started my business... 2018, a lot of people looked at me like I was insane. You, you, got, you, you get a retired check, you've invested well, you know, do you really need to start a business? I'm like, what am I going to do? Am I going to sit around? Am I going to quit mowing the lawn? You know, am I, am I going to do nothing? So I said, no, 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 no. But I, what I don't want to do is I don't want to change jobs 27 times either. What right. I wanted to do is I, wanted, I want to commit to the thing that I'm going to do for the rest of my life. And so I looked and I studied and I thought about it and I said, where are my skills, my networks, my abilities? What's my motivation? What is it that I want to do? What are those things? Where am I going to go with this? A friend of mine said, well, what, what's your objective? I said, I want to be the best leadership consultant in the world. And he was like, well, yeah, that's quite a, I said, yes, but I'm not in competition with anybody because I get to define it. I get to decide, define what all that is. So yes, you can be a leader at, at any age. You just have to decide you want to do it. And then, and then identify what are the things you need to do it now? I want to be a leader. I want to do these things. What are the things that I need to do within, my, within what I'm going to lead, right? Because it's a little different everywhere, right? I mean, I don't have a thousand people around me in a big company. It's me. I might have some more people here, you know, a little bit, but who am I leading? I'm leading people that I engage with. So my context is a little different. Figure that out. Figure out where you want to go. Figure out who you want to be and then do it one thing at a time, one day at a time, right? That's how you eat the elephant, right? One bite at a time. Right? So eat the elephant one bite at a time. Yeah, you can do it. Absolutely. So stick your thumb in everybody's eye that tells you otherwise, but not physically, okay? Metaphorically, but just go do it. Do the work. Heavy deadlifts with faith. No, it's awesome. I, I absolutely love it. Colonel, thank you so much. This is this has been, as always, enlightening, eye-opening, encouraging, inspiring, 
Like you really, really do walk your talk. Where can people find you online? Well, if they want to send me an email, they can email me at, uh, you know, tom at connollyconsulting.com. They can find me on my website where you can find links to my book, to my latest excerpt of my book there on personal performance. Uh, They can find me on Facebook at 247 Leadership. I'm on LinkedIn. And I got an Instagram account out there, Connolly uh, underscore consulting. Again, uh, for everyone out there, the website is ConnollyConsulting.com, two N's, two L's. And the book is Becoming a Leader. Get a copy of this book. It is chock full of leadership wisdom and insight. It's, 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 it's fantastic. And it's written by someone who truly, truly walks his talk. Colonel, as always, it's an honor, a pleasure, and a privilege to, to be with you. Thanks, Mark. It was a lot of fun. <laughs>